Hello everybody, I'm Marco Raveri. In this video, I want to show you the reconstruction of gravitational theories directly from cosmological data. I believe that our universe is the perfect system to study gravity. As the universe evolves, it spans many orders of magnitude in energy, and in the standard cosmological model after hydrogen recombination very early on, the whole universe behaves like a gigantic, purely gravitational system. One of the reasons why we are also interested in studying gravity on cosmological scales is the observation that as we go to late times in our universe, we need to introduce two dark components, dark matter and dark energy, to just fit cosmological observations. And we need dark matter to provide the gravitational infrastructures for galaxies to grow in and dark energy to fuel cosmic acceleration. And the properties of dark energy are so exotic that it makes sense to ask whether instead of having dark energy, this type of behavior is related to having modifications to the laws of gravity in the very deep infrared. And the physical nature of dark matter, dark energy, and gravity is the target of the next generation of cosmological experiments, some of which you see here. And this aim at detecting properties of these two dark components through their indirect effect on the fluctuations in temperature of the cosmic microwave background and in the clustering pattern of galaxies. And since some of these experiments already took data, we already have data from them, and we are expecting the next generation, I think it makes sense to ask ourselves, how, how did we do so far in the search for the physical nature of dark energy and gravity? And I have done this, this simple exercise of going through the archive, doing some literature bounces. And roughly, I counted that we have tested order 100 models so far. And I have contributed many. And if you're interested in doing a more precise calculation, let me know the result you find. And if we had 100 models, and these were all random uncorrelated trials, then that would mean that we should have at least five models that are detected at two sigma. And if we are a little bit lucky, and we don't really need to be too much lucky, perhaps we would have one model that's detected at three sigma. The harsh reality is that we have none, that, that we have no model that, that stands at this statistical significance uh, once faced with the full set of cosmological observations we have so far. And this reality check, I think, teaches us two things. The first one is that these trials are not really correlated. They are probably correlated. And in fact, in this number, I have counted many models that are small modifications of the same underlying idea. And they are not really random. They are probably just looking in the wrong direction. And I take this as an indication of the fact that when it comes to dark energy and modified gravity uh, on cosmological scales, we really have poor theoretical guidance. We don't really know where to look, but we are going to have, and we already have plenty of data power that we need to use and we need to make the best possible use of. So we want to, make, to still make progress, even if we don't really have guidance in doing so. People have figured out how to overcome the situation and still make progress. And this entails using bottom-up approaches that borrow ideas from effective field theory techniques that are blind in the sense that they don't really need much theoretical guidance. The only ingredients that we know are the symmetries of the physical system that we consider, so the symmetries of FRW, which is spatial homogeneity and isotropy, and broken time diffeomorphisms because we have time evolution. And then restricting those to the physical, to the limit that we are interested in, which is very large cosmological scales. And people have worked out what's the most general description of gravity and dark energy compatible with these two requirements. And this ends up having one extra scalar degree of freedom. And if we stop at two derivatives, in, in a, a theory that has at most two derivatives and it's universally coupled to matter, then all models of dark energy and gravity 
are in, uh, compressed into five functions of time only. And they are all functions of time because of the broken time symmetry. Perhaps not surprisingly, the cosmological constant that in the standard model is time independent, acquires a time dependence. We have a function that's a time dependent Planck mass, and we have other functions that are more related to the physical properties of this extrascalar degree of freedom that we have, its kinetic energy, its couplings, and how gravitational waves traveling through the scalar field uh, have uh, a modified dispersion relation. This is great progress. We have started with the full space of uh, modified gravity, and we have found something that's more manageable, five functions of time. And we would, you know, we would be tempted to just say, you know, let's go out and measure these functions. And the reminder of this video, I'll try to convince you that this is much easier said than done, but I'll show you how it's done. We have the problem that we want to measure functions of time directly from the data in this case. And you immediately realize that the space of one dimensional function is infinite dimensional, while our data is always, always going to be very inconveniently finite dimensional. So there can't be any correspondence, one-to-one -one correspondence between the two. But it, as it turns out, what we need to do to make progress is slightly discope our, our uh, project. And instead of reconstructing all possible functions of time, all possible theories of gravity, we want to reconstruct functions that have slow variations. Because as basically Fourier analysis tells us, the space of band-limited functions, functions up to a certain frequency, is finite dimension. Now, this is the idea behind Gaussian process regression and some machine learning techniques with some slight differences in the sense that in this case, we are not working directly in data space. We are working in modified gravity space, and our data is very far from that. It's the CMB, the clustering of large scale cosmological structures. So there's, there's a map between the two, and we have no expectation that the posterior of this function has to be Gaussian, as in Gaussian processes. So people have worked out how to work with these, uh, with this generalization of Gaussian processes, and the key idea is to implement a smoothness low pass filter prior on the space of the functions that we want to reconstruct. And I think this perfectly matches our idea on, on how, you know, how physics should work in cosmology. We have this idea that physics has to go on the Hubble scale in cosmology, and this just makes it very precise. This turns it into a precise statement. And it works this way. If if we have seen after the fact that you know, our gravity reconstruction was smooth and nice as, the, the, as one of these figures, we would be keen to accept it. We would be a little bit more uncomfortable with a function that's at the low pass filter that has those slight time variations. And we would definitely be very suspicious if the theory of gravity we reconstructed showed all the oscillations of the high frequency model there. Now, we want to penalize those high frequency oscillations because we don't really believe, we have no expectation that these are related to physical models and those oscillations really look like data noise that, that we don't want to reconstruct. So we are going to penalize gradually these oscillations. So we have translated the problem of estimating functions of time to the problem of estimating one number, which is the low pass frequency. And differently from what people usually do in Gaussian process regression, what we have done so far in a series of work is develop a theoretical prior for the cutoff frequency. And in the way in which we have done this is uh, by generating billions of models with different parameters, with different families of models, uh, without any reference to the data, uh, just requiring that they show late time cosmic acceleration in a very mild way. And then to all these models, we have just asked one question. What's the typical time scale of variations in the model? And it turns out that a cutoff frequency 
of a third e-fold, of a third of an e-fold, is a good time scale for this type of models. This is the precise formalization of the concept that modified gravity goes on the Hubble scale in cosmology. Once we have that single ingredient from theory, uh, from theory guidance, we need to gear up for the task of performing this exercise. And I want to, um, to thank my col longtime collaborators on this, developing the state-of-the-art tools to do so, bringing the effective field theory of dark energy from its theoretical construction all the way down to the data, CMB observations and matter power spectrum observation and recently gravitational waves. Once we have the, all the tools we need, we need to stack all the available data power because to do this exercise, we, we just want to have uh, good data. So in this particular case, I was using Planck uh, CM temperature measurements, um, polarization and lensing reconstruction data, uh, distance measurements from Pantheon supernovae, uh, BAO measurements, local measurements of the Hubble constant, and some information from large-scale structure surveys from uh, CFH DNAs. And once we have all these ingredients, the tools, the data, and some prescription for some very mild theoretical guidance, we can go through the exercise. And this is the result. This is the reconstruction, the complete reconstruction of gravitation theories on cosmological scales at late times. We can stare at this figure, and, and I, I really like to think that this is the data speaking to us directly in a language that we can understand on a from, from a theoretical side. Uh, you can look at this figure and, and try to see interesting features. I'm going to comment on a couple of those. You can check out the paper for different types of models, different types of combinations of these control functions. Um, and, and a more detailed story. The first aspect that I want to uh, emphasize is that we have five functions of time. One of them is unconstrained. So I'm only showing four. Then the constraints that we have are all order 10%. 40% uh, for the speed of gravitational waves, 30% for the Planck mass, and 100% for the cosmological constant itself. And these are all relative numbers. So uh, what, while we used to think that we have very strong uh, constraints on these type of models, as we open up time dependencies as three degrees of freedom, uh, then we see that, that that's not actually the case. One incredible thing that I want to highlight is that we can go through the statistical exercise of understanding how many of these frequencies how many of these parameters are we measuring? And it turns out that this is the astounding number of 28. There are 28 frequencies in these functions of time that are just measured by data, which is an incredible show off of data power, I believe. Some of these numbers are measured to be zero, and some of these numbers are measured not to be zero, and the ones that are not zero are related to uh, tensions that were present in the data sets that we used for this exercise. In particular, uh, I want to comment briefly on the role of the Hubble constant tension and how these models relieve it uh, to some degree. As we can see here, this is the Hubble diagram of supernovae observations and the difference between the entry and the exit from the Hubble diagram uh, is the difference in the Hubble constant and um, the best fit reconstruction reaches a best fit value of 71. And this is mostly an observational no-go theorem. It tells us that, and it was surprising at first, it tells us that even when we throw, you know, very large freedom to fit the data, we can only do about a half of the Hubble constant tension. We can't go precisely on target. It also tells us other interesting things. From a model perspective, this type of, this type of tension relieving relies on three ingredients. It relies on jointly the effect of having a time-dependent uh, cosmological constant and Planck mass. 
and in, arranged in such a way that they need non-negligible uh, higher order couplings to stabilize the resulting theory. And the, uh, this, this model working with the data relies on the small feature you see in the Hubble diagram. It can't really be achieved if we just had a simple step through the data because, and, and it looks like this because this because don't really look that interesting until you plot the two vertical lines that tells us the two uh, time scales that we that we know we have at late times, the redshift of acceleration and dark energy, dark matter equality. We can look at this feature in the BAOs and it's fairly surprising uh, to see that it's coherent between supernovas and BAO. And in fact, the best fit solution slightly improves the fit to both data sets. And this is an example in which the reconstruction of dark energy models uh, is telling us what are interesting features in, in the data to look out for. In this video, I have shown you the first full reconstruction of dark energy and gravity on cosmological scales. And this relies only on symmetries and data power. And the, the remarkable result, I believe, is that there is already enough data power to constrain dark energy and gravity on cosmological scales as a function of time tomographically. And it's a part of ongoing efforts to understand what this type of reconstruction means for specific models that we might be interested in from a theoretical perspective. Filling up the gap, the bottom-up approach of going without theoretical guidance from the data to theories. And current constraints on dark energy and gravity in full generality are still order of 10%. And I think this is the perfect space to gauge the performances of future experiments. Because if we have cosmological observations at a specific range of times and scales, those will show up in improved constraints at those times and scales. And these types of approaches are guaranteed to find all features in the data that are compatible with our, expect with our theoretical expectations on smoothness of these type of models. And some of them, you know, th there's some of them in the data. And it's, I believe, interesting to understand whether they will remain there as we gather more and more precise data. At present, uh, one of the things they, they provide is an observational no-go theorem for late time solutions to the Hubble constant tension that can at most go halfway. The practical feasibility of this program scales logarithmically. So we have to show that we can do this exercise for one function or two functions, and then this can be extended to many more paying only a logarithmic price. And this, I believe, is the most transformative conclusion that I want to tell you. We already have enough data power on cosmological scales that we can afford not just to test gravity on cosmological scales, but to learn gravity directly from the data. 